Hello and welcome to this urban security briefing. This month's discussion has been, of course, triggered by the mass protests and global outrage sparked by the death of George Floyd, a black man, while being arrested by the police in the United States. This has sparked a global discussion on the use of force, sometimes lethal by the police, among many other issues. Uh, and this issue of uh, um, police violence became a truly international wave of protests, uh, with protests spanning the United Kingdom here, where, where I am now, as well as Kenya, South Africa, and many other countries. And the search for security in cities, particularly in low-income peripheries and slums, has often sparked similar debates about violence um, by the security agents themselves, as well as the implications this carries for government legitimacy and democratic order. So in today's discussion, we are bringing three examples from three very different places. And the fact that police violence is a common challenge among them displays just the obstacles that countries have faced in policing violent areas uh, in cities. So um, I'm very pleased to be joined today by uh, uh, three uh, experts from very different uh, geographical expertise, but um, fortunately with very complementary uh, expertise on this policing issue and security. Do Dr. Inácio Cano is a professor of sociology at the Rio de Janeiro uh, um, State University, UERJ, and is currently a visiting researcher at the Safety Lab in Cape Town. Dr. Zoha Wasim is a postdoctoral research fellow at the Institute for Global City Policing at University College London. And Dr. Tessa Difun is assistant professor at the Department of Cultural Anthropology at Utrecht University, where she currently conducts a research project on policing in Kenya. So you, um, uh, the audience, uh, you have um, a few options on how you choose to connect with us and, and, and ask questions. So you can type your questions uh, by writing, uh, by clicking on the Q&A uh, option um, that is lying on the, on the bottom of your Zoom screen or you can raise your hand and then we will give you a voice to, uh, to ask a question verbally. Um, so with that, I shall we start uh, our discussion. I thought we could start in the East and gradually make our way West. Not sure why, but I thought it, it, it was at least logical. So um, Zoha, perhaps I could uh, start with you. One of the facets of this problem has been the militarization of police, which officers, uh, with officers gradually adopting high caliber weapons and more aggressive tactics. The Pakistani city of Karachi has seen not only police, but also army crackdowns against a variety of armed groups. So tell us a, a, about the, the, the case of Karachi and what lessons can we, can it, can we take from there? Um, thank you so much, Antonio, for inviting me to speak here. Um, so as you know, and as our, as our viewers will also know, Karachi, uh, in Karachi, the police have been responding to multiple forms of urban violence over the last several decades. Um, and this violence has included actors such as criminal gangs, armed militants that have been associated with political parties, um, armed militants that have been associated with, associated with religious groups, and also other non-state actors, some of whom have been patronized by the state and some others that have been patronized by other states in the region. Um, and it is in this context that I've sort of been exploring and, and trying to study uh, policing in Karachi. Um, as you may also know, a security operation has been was started in Karachi in 2013 to root out some of the groups that were responsible for violence in the city. And to a large extent, these groups have been dismantled or weakened over the past few years. But in the last month or so, we have seen a few trying to resurface. And last week, we also saw an attack on the Pakistan Stock Exchange in Karachi that's, that was carried out by a separatist militant group. So the challenge has been very real. And the networks that have been formed between these groups within Karachi, but also beyond outside of the city, have made cycles of violence very difficult to break in sustainable ways. Um, and when the state has tried to break these cycles of crime and violence, it has often happened very brutally. And state institutions, including political parties and military, have periodically allowed the police and other institutions tasked with policing in Karachi to use all means necessary to root out these groups. And although extensive resources and training and investment has gone into the police and their equipment, and some of the high caliber weapons, as you mentioned, uh, not enough resources have actually been spent in drafting and implementing good policies at local, national, 
national or regional levels to address the root causes behind ethnic, political, religious, and or criminal violence and conflict in Karachi and in Pakistan at large. Um, so that's partly why violence tends to return to the city in one form or another and may continue to do so, although, although the scale of violence might change and the audiences uh, and the identities of these perpetrators might change also. Um, so this, of course, has also put the police at risk in Karachi as well. And around a thousand have probably been killed in Karachi over the last decade. Um, of course, on the other hand, about 3,000 civilians, by my own estimates, have been killed in extrajudicial killings by law enforcement agencies in Karachi around the same period over the last decade. Um, what is problematic, in, in my opinion, is the way a whole range of issues that require um, political and socioeconomic solutions have been framed and propagated as security threats or even terrorism by the state. And these threats include those that I have just mentioned, so organized crime, political and sectarian violence. But the same framing then gets applied to entire groups of people and entire communities, ethnic and religious minorities, for example, that do not partake in violence, but maybe because of their identity, a shared identity, and maybe because of their geographical proximity to these groups, because of the neighborhoods they live in, for example, they are indirectly associated with the groups that do engage in violence. And because these entire communities and neighborhoods are securitized or criminalized, uh, police repression and brutality becomes you know, a periodic occurrence in, in these urban spaces and against these communities, with their members being picked up, um, being interrogated, and even tortured and killed in some instances. Um, this question is justified to the argument that we are at war um, and extraordinary me measures need to be taken. And this is something I think that needs to be critically examined and reconsidered. And this is why state policies need to be reviewed if we are to expect better from the police. Um, so the focus in Karachi is very much still on responding to these issues militarily, as you mentioned, um, because they're seen through these lenses of security threats and warfare. And that's why the focus of policing organizations has been more on response, reaction, and defense, and less on dialogue and community engagement. And because Karachi's issues are then you know, collectively framed in these security terms and tied to the, national, the country's national security infrastructure, military and paramilitary forces have also played a significant role in the policing landscape of Karachi and continue to do so, which is, of course, a product in part of the military's continued involvement in Pakistan's internal affairs. So in my opinion, the way that violent and armed conflicts in Karachi and cities like Karachi have been policed or been made to police, it has resulted in these two ongoing processes and patterns, which I want to discuss. And in a way that these two patterns seem to facilitate and reinforce each other. So in the first pattern, we've seen overly securitized responses to political, ethnic, and socioeconomic grievances specific to Karachi have allowed the implementation of extraordinary measures that put the interest and protection of the state above local residents and citizens. And as a result, the police have been encouraged to demonstrate zero tolerance towards a whole range of issues, which has furthered the militarization of policing. And I will come back to this in a second. In the second pattern, um, we have seen subsequent governments, both civilian and military, as well as political, bureaucratic, and social elite, um, we've seen them exploit the weaknesses and problems within the policing institutions, patronizing individual officers and furthering procedural informality. And I'll come back to this in a second as well. But the exploitation of the police has, ha has happened at the expense of reforming policing in a way that could improve its administration, oversight, and public accountability. Now, both of these processes, militarization of policing and exploitation of procedural informality, have collectively undermined the possibility of procedural fairness on the part of the police. And as a result, public trust in the police has remained low, historically so, because policing as a public good or a service has never been provided equally, evenly, or even fairly. And because of these two processes, we have seen the police struggle during the COVID-19 pandemic more recently as well, um, struggle to ensure compliance and cooperation in certain neighborhoods, struggle to police passion and empathy, and struggle to maintain the well-being and legitimacy of its own workforce. My assessment is that in the context of policing urban violence in cities like Karachi, militarization uh, of civilian policing and exploitation of procedural informality is a product of problematic state policies that are pushed and propagated by officials and elites that have their own political and economic interests in mind. Now, to explain the first pattern that I have identified, the militarization of policing in Karachi, I can break it down to, to you know, further into two elements or two parts. Um, in the first part, I want to briefly mention how the use of force or extrajudicial killings have been actively encouraged and condoned over the last three decades, even before the war on terror began. 
Of course, there have been police officers that have been critical of such practices, but because of the political patronage, corruption, lack of faith in the justice system, a general lack of institutional accountability, we have seen extrajudicial killings and excessive use of force against militants, uh, political party activists, ordinary criminals, and at times even innocent civilians. Again, such excessive use of force has been made possible because the way internal challenges and unrest from militancy to street crime has been framed uh, as, as security threats or threats to the stability of the state that need to be eliminated and be dealt with through zero tolerance. I think to an extent, this is part of Pakistan's colonial legacy, yes, but it is also very much a product of the continued acceptance of this legacy and a failure to move away from authoritarian styles of policing. Um, and then the second part, uh, as, you, as you touched upon as well, um, the militarization has also been furthered by a continued pr presence and penetration of the military in Karachi through the Sindh Rangers, which is a paramilitary force that has been involved in everyday routine policing in the city. And policing powers have been granted to them through various governments over the last three decades. Um, what we are seeing in Karachi is this growing realization within the civilian police that they are perhaps playing second in command, that they have less popular legitimacy than the paramilitary force, even though they are probably doing better policing than the rangers in some respects. Um, and I think this is deeply problematic because this sort of institutional competition between the police and the military has been laying the foundations for the civilian police to want to become more and more like its military or con paramilitary counterparts, which is very concerning because ideally the two institutions should have very different roles and responsibilities. Now, in the second part that I mentioned, um, the, the exploitation of procedural informality, what I, meant, what I mean by procedural informality is this tendency of the police to bypass the formal rules and procedures put in place for them to follow. In countries like Pakistan, civilians, uh, state representatives, and the police know that not everything is done by the book, that there, are certain, that there is a certain level of flexibility afforded to the police. This is, of course, a gray area and a murky area because a little bit of flexibility and you have discretion, which is necessary in some cases, but a lot of flexibility and you have rampant corruption. So the procedural informality or informalization is not always bad, but in the absence of, of accountability and oversight mechanisms, procedural informality can undermine the delivery of good policing and good police work to people who live on the margins. I think in countries like Pakistan, the problem is the extent to which this flexibility is exploited by those in power and those with influence, those with enough social and political capital. And what this exploitation does is that it furthers this unequal distribution of policing and the uneven application of police power and authority. This, of course, disadvantages certain communities like minority groups, refugees, or other marginalized communities who reside together in mega cities like Karachi. Therefore, when security threats are framed, procedural informality results in the police providing more public security to those with greater social and political capital and who live in nicer neighborhoods, leaving less police or less good policing for those on the margins and who live in slums and informal settlements, for example. The procedural informality on the part of the police and its exploitation furthers the socioeconomic divides within Karachi society and urban fabric and determines to what extent securitized and criminalized communities will be policed and how they will be, will be policed. Um, of course, this exacerbation of socioeconomic divides also fuels the possibility of crime and violence, which is why I'm a little skeptical about how long lasting this unsustainable this, this current peace in Karachi will be. So it's almost as if the exploitation of procedural informality enables the militarization of police response in some neighborhoods, because when entire neighborhoods or communities are perceived as security threats, procedural informality and its exploitation allows the state or the governments in power to use the police to work against these communities, often outside the law, whether that's to counter terrorism or ethnopolitical violence or crime. And what this then, of course, does is it makes the people hesitant to approach the police, which shows a lack of, of, of trust in the police. Um, and this is, this is because not everybody is experiencing the police in the same manner, in the same way, and because not everybody is treated like an equal citizen by them. So just to wrap up, um, as long as the social, uh, social and political elite keep exploiting the police in Karachi for their own interests and authority, and as long as the state keep adv keeps advocating for militarized responses to issues that require other solutions, better governance, development, housing, employment, education, the police in cities like Karachi will continue to struggle to provide public security in a way that does not infringe upon civil liberties, compromise their own legitimacy, and weaken police community relations. So I'll stop here now, thank you.
Can't hear you. Apologies. Uh, thank you very much, Zoha. Um, Tessa, moving on to Kenya, uh, particularly Nairobi, um, police have had a very difficult and violent relationship with uh, low-income urban communities, uh, but there have also been government attempts to introduce some reforms and address at least some of these issues. So has, has the Kenyan police changed at all? How is the situation um, in, in Kenya right now? Well, thanks for that question, and, and of course, thanks to you and the um, International Institute for Strategic Studies for having me here today. Um, so, I mean, the question of whether the police has changed, I would say definitely there have been some changes. The question is whether these have been enough. Um, and so in the projects I'm working on now, I, I focus on kind of larger police reform trajectories, and I look at the kind of the various mechanisms and institutions that are in place to kind of monitor and regulate police misconduct. And now, I don't know how many of you are aware about Nairobi or Kenya in general, but I mean, police violence is, is a serious issue in Nairobi, uh, which in addition to high crime rates and of course to the current terrorist attacks with the Westgate Mall attack of September 2013 is the most kind of infamous one. Um, amidst all of these threats, the National Police Service of Kenya is not really seen as a custodian of peace, but for many inhabitants is seen as a very large part of the problem. Um, for almost all Nairobians, the police is mistrusted and feared and this fear comes from various forms of misconduct, such as corruption, but also for the more kind of structural intimidation of police brutality that is still very common. And just to give you a very recent example, so yesterday um, there was a march called the Saba Saba March. Saba Saba translated from Swahili means 7-7, seven, seven, so the 7th of July, which is a very commemorative day in Kenya. There was a march that was organized for the third time in a row against police violence, against police brutality. And at the first uh, march, which was two years ago, which I attended, um, it was a very uh, peaceful protest uh, and they were able to, to do what they had set out to do, um, which was a bit of a surprise. However, yesterday, this was not the case. And so protesters were tear gas. Eventually, from my latest record, from what I heard is that 58 people were arrested and basically people were stopped from demonstrating and so therefore, you know, executing one of their fundamental rights. And so, in explaining instances like yesterday, but of course, you know, also, you know, police killings or extrajudicial killings, one of the main explanations for this is that um, police reform, which has been a very extensive trajectory over the past 20 years or so, has failed. Um, and of course, on the one hand, I, I concur with this argument that a lot of the re police reform efforts have not you know, succeeded in, in bringing about the change that was intended. I also argue that police is, a process and not kind of an overnight remedy. Um, and one of the places that we can identify where some changes happen is in this issue of oversight, which kind of relates to what Zoha was talking about now. And so in Kenya, um, we have several oversight mechanisms that are there to monitor, regulate police misconduct. And although they have also been heavily critiqued, which I also agree with, I also argue that kind of the mere existence of these bodies does play a role. Um, and that this is something that many countries, particularly in Europe, could learn from, where many of these oversight mechanisms are, are completely lacking, um, for example. And so just to tell you a little bit about what these oversight bodies are. Um, so uh, as I mentioned, police reform in Kenya has been quite an extensive project, um, and it, it was really initiated uh, after the uh, post-election violence of 2007, 2008, where it became very clear that a lot of deaths were the results of police actions. Um, and through the establishment of the new constitution in 2010 and the National Police Service Act, um, there came kind of this, this moment to, to really transform the police. And I don't have time to really delve into all the details, um, but it, you know, it entailed transforming the police force to a police service, restructuring the entire police structure, new trainings, revamped community policing programs, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but a big part of this was also establishing formal oversight bodies that oversee, monitor, and regulate police misconduct. Um, and there's two key ones that we should, we should look at. So the first is the Internal Affairs Unit, which basically is a unit within the police that comprises of police officers that basically investigate their colleagues, so to speak. Um, and um, the IU is more, the Internal Affairs Unit, is more responsible for less what we could call serious and urgent cases. It focuses more on administrative issues rather than criminal ones. Although these two 
tend to be very much interconnected. So they'll look at, for example, that a police officer fails to report an incident in an occurrence book or provide citizens with receipts of their cash bill, for example. Um, and to give you a bit of an, uh, a guess or a, a, a figure, in 2019, the IU received a total of, of 1,139 complaints from both members of the public, public but also police officers. Now, for more serious cases, such as police killings, there is an external and civilian-led oversight body, which is the Independent Policing Oversight Authority, which was established in 2011. Now, IPOA is responsible as a state institution, an independent state institution, that uh, investigates deaths and serious injuries caused by the police, but also monitors policing operations, uh, police recruitment, inspects police premises, and et cetera. And on a global scale, IPOA is regarded as a highly progressive um, oversight body having a very extensive mandate that exceeds most of the authorities that have been established elsewhere. And again, to give you a bit of a figure, in April 2018, uh, which was when the new board took over, so it was seen as a kind of transition period, uh, IPOA had received over just under 10,000 complaints, of which a little over 5,000 had been classified for investigation. Now, from these 5,000 complaints, 100 were forwarded to the ODPP, so the Department of Public Private prosecution for prosecution, and in April 28, only 64 of these were before the courts. So we see a vast amount of complaints coming in, and, and eventually, according to many, a very small amount that actually uh, comes to the court, for example. Um, and there have been some very kind of notorious cases of police officers that have been found guilty for murdering um, an individual. So on the one hand, we see these kind of these great efforts that are being done to change the police, including the setting up of these oversight uh, committees. On the other hand, we see the police brutality is still, is still, is still an everyday occurrence. Um, and so a very kind of easy, I would, I, I argue, a very easy explanation to say, well, police reform has failed. Uh, we're not seeing the change that we want to, particularly since police reform in Kenya and perhaps elsewhere, is heavily funded by, by donors, by foreign donors. Um, uh, it's seen as something that has failed to achieve the success that it has. So the IAU, so the Internal Affairs June, is criticized for, uh, you know, being an insider and not being really able to investigate their own, while IPOA is criticized for not being able to work well with the police and establish a certain level of rapport to be able to investigate crime, because police officers often simply refuse to work with IPOA, for example. Um, and I, I concur with some of these, this critique, of course. And, and one of the things that I would like to highlight here, and this is maybe a lesson that we can take from this, is that what is often missing from both oversight institutions is a more proactive stance. So for example, to come back to the sub sub of March that occurred yesterday, where was IPOA when this was happening? Now, according to their mandates, IPOA um, is also responsible for over overseeing policing operations, which refers to you know, the policing of protests and demonstrations. And this protest, this march, had been announced months before. So everybody knew that this was going to take place. So I question, along with others, is where I was not somebody from my power present to firsthand document what was happening. So I feel that these institutions could take a much more proactive stance in really witnessing what, what is happening. However, um, I also, despite all of this critique, I do argue that the mere existence of these oversight bodies is crucial. Even though we can argue that 64 cases that have been brought to the courts is very little, these are still 64 cases. And without these oversight bodies, I mean, of course, we can never really know this for certain, these cases probably wouldn't have been brought to court. Um, and I think that particularly if we look at the global scale of what's happening now with the calls to defund the police and decrease, increase civilian oversight, I definitely think that we can look to countries that do have these oversight institutions and look at, okay, what's working there and what isn't working, um, but that, that some kind of um, effort to try and establish oversight bodies is crucial, despite the critique that they do receive. Um, so therefore, I mean, I, I guess that's the main thing that I want to say is that despite high levels of violence, police violence in Kenya, I do think that there are lessons that could be learned, particularly in terms of oversight. And I think this is particularly important in, in our current times of COVID-19, where we see that COVID-19 has been very much securitized um, and it's treated much more as a, as a security problem than a health hazard. And we can see cases of police violence increasing in the last few months. So I think this just emphasizes the need for, for oversight 
Um, and this also includes informal oversight. So the in tremendous role that civil society and justice centers and, and very kind of courageous human rights defenders are playing. Um, and that we also need to look at the work that they're doing, which is something that's happening on a global scale now and, and how they also kind of place pressure on the police to, to act differently. So those are my two cents for now. Thanks a lot, Tessa. Um, Inacio, now uh, I've saved the, 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 the case of Rio for last. Uh, it's, it's, it's the one that perhaps is closer to my, um, to my research and also to my, to my heart because it's the city where, where I'm from. My parents live there. And it, it, it is sad to think that Rio de Janeiro uh, has become one of the classic case studies, right, in militarized police with uh, military police raids in favelas, um, and shootouts becoming an almost routine occurrence. So you, you've researched this issue uh, for a very long time. How, how did we get at this point? Why has this model of policing remained in place for so, so long there? Yes, um, Antonio, this is a good question. So I'm afraid I don't have a final answer to mm. that, but I will try to paint a, a bit of a context um, for people who are watching. Um, um, like in the case of, uh, I believe, Pakistan and Kenya and many other countries, low income areas have absolutely no trust in the police. The police are seen as corrupt and as violent, and therefore their degree of legitimacy is extremely low. So how did we get there? First, we have to understand that um, the police do not control the territory. Uh, criminal groups, armed criminal groups do control the territory, and therefore police entry into this territory is some kind of a, a military operation of invasion of territory or trying to recover the territory. It's not normal policing on your beat. Um, it's a very different kind of policing. Um, also, that means that police enter this territory in an unpredictable way. And this generates shootouts and a lot of insecurity. And in that respect, we have pieces of research and surveys that show that people are more afraid of the police People in the slums, of course, in the favelas, are more afraid of the police than of the drug dealers. And the main reason for that is that the drug dealers have more or less clear norms. So if you follow the rules, you don't mess with them, they don't mess with you. Whereas the police arrive suddenly shooting and generate a lot of insecurity. Um, also, the criminal groups do develop uh, assistance activities. They will um, buy toys for the kids. In Christmas, uh, they will organize parties and the police don't generally do that. Um, when there are internal conflicts within the communities, say a conflict with your neighbor, what people do is call the drug leaders, call the armed groups to regulate these conflicts and exercise quote unquote um, social regulation and justice. They do not call the police. They do not call the police for two reasons. One is they don't trust the police, um, as we said before, and second is they might be uh, fearful of reprisals from the criminal groups who do control the territory if they bring the police to, to the premises. In general, the police tend to see local inhabitants as suspects. And when they enter these areas, it's like they're entering enemy territory. Um, they have the reasons to be afraid. I mean, that, that's for sure. But uh, the, the whole mindset is they are entering, it's like the Israeli army entering Gaza um, or the West Bank. That's the sort of frame of mind that the police in Rio generally have when they enter the slums. Um, so over the last few years, there's been a degradation because up to, I would say a year ago, two years ago, when the police killed somebody who was ostensibly innocent, a young child or an old lady, there was a shock and awe and uproar and a scandal and then the police withdrew for a while the government kind of apologized and the police acted in a more contained way for some time until the cycle started again however lately with the these governments both in rio de janeiro state and in in brazil as a whole which have been advocating the killing openly the killing of suspects uh, over the last few uh, year, I would say, the killing of innocent people has not stopped police operations. And the governor himself said, well, you know, this is a price we have to pay. Sometimes innocent people will die, but we have to fight crime and it's the first time we're doing that. Um, so there has been an intensification of these operations under the assumption that they will ultimately and eventually 
solve the security issue. Um, at the same time, there's a lot of corruption in the police. Um, so that's one more reason not to trust the police. And many people will not report crimes, crimes that happen in the favela to the police because they are afraid that the, some police officers will tell other police officers and then they will eventually tell the drug dealers. And we have reports, for example, in the cases of militias, which are um, sort of groups of corrupt law enforcement officers where somebody has gone to the police station to report this. And then by the time they came back home, they were being awaited by the local um, police officers saying, oh, we know you've been to the police. Don't do that. It's, gonna, it's very dangerous for you. So it took them a very short time to be informed of the, of the report. So I would say that basically the main problem is that local communities do not see the police as their police. They do not think that the police is there to protect them. Rather, they think the police is there to contain them. And it's there to protect other people from them who are considered to be the more dangerous people and to uh, stop the violence and the crime from spreading outside the borders of these communities. I've been in, in several inter interviews with police officers where they said, for example, well, there's no point in establishing police stations in the slums because they're not going to report to the police anyway. Um, so the idea is why waste our police resources with these areas in traditional policing when that's never going to happen. So the, the aim of the police apparently is to contain violence and crime within these areas and stop it from spreading. Of course, they also fail at that, uh, but that, that seems to be their aim. And it's certainly the perception that people in the communities have. When we have tried to mediate sometimes in conflicts between the police and local communities, and we have tried to convince the communities that police in principle should be there to protect them, even though they don't perceive it to be like that, the uh, attitude of the community has been very negative and, and like completely unwilling to accept even the possibility that the police are there to protect them. So basically the police enter these areas in, in a very defensive uh, manner to protect themselves and the citizens also when they see the police they think of protecting themselves from the police uh, to the point that some people raise the question would we be better off without policing altogether in these areas and this discussion i think could be linked to the present discussion in some countries about defunding the police would we be better off without police full stop now um, if you think about this question from a point of view of the middle class areas, people will surely say um, that would be impossible because if we do that, then crime is gonna take over. If we have no police, then criminals gonna take over. But in these slums, crime has already taken over um, and they control the community. So the fear that if we have no police, then the crime would prevail is inexistent because crime is already prevailing. And for example, if I remember uh, discussions with the World Bank where they insisted on the importance of having property titles for the people in the slums to be able to own their houses. You may have a property title, but if the drug lord says you need to leave, you leave, regardless of your property title. And the most the police can do is accompany you to pick up your belongings so that you can leave and get your stuff with you. Um, so I think it's a very strong question for people in the slums. Uh, and many of them will tell you, we don't want police at all whatsoever. Of course, if they had good policing or the policing they would respect, the answer would be different, but many people do not believe this is a real possibility. And last but not least, I also wanted to raise the, the point that um, some people, and especially many um, human rights activists like myself, tend to see this as a institutional problem. We have a problematic police and we have to reform police so that we can be better protected. I think that's a very biased view because in fact, um, there is significant piece of research to show that many people, even in these communities, support, for example, extrajudicial killings and illegal use of force. So it's not just an institutional problem, it's a social problem. And the fact that both Witzel as a governor of Rio de Janeiro and Bolsonaro himself as a president of the country have been elected, I think shows very clearly that we are facing a um, civic culture problem. And uh, until we fix that, it will be very difficult to fix the police because there's a lot of demand from the communities to, for that to happen. And even from poor people and black people in the communities who are going to suffer these kind of interventions, there is considerable support for these um, operations.
So I'll leave it there and I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Inasio. Um, we already have um, one question here, and I also wanted to precisely touch on the point of uh, corruption, which you you mentioned, um, and uh, perhaps also to to, to Zohar and Tessa, um, if you think that police corruption is one of the the is, 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 a, is a critical central issue in this debate about police violence and use of force. If police corruption, uh, either through the exploitation of communities through bribery or extortion by the police, or also perhaps infiltration of armed groups into the police, if those instances of corruption, if they encourage police violence or if you don't quite see a, a correlation there. Uh, so just picking your brain on this issue of police corruption. We also have a question um, that is a bit cultural on the issue of um, um, police as, as an instrument to, of punitive urbanism and um, uh, securitization of, of, of the city. Um, I, I wanted to, to, to touch on that, but also transform that into a more uh, policy uh, related question, which is um, how do you see poli police violence in, in the, the cases that you have studied in respect to some uh, social groups, so for instance, ethnic groups, uh, uh, sectarian groups. In the case of uh, in the case of Rio, perhaps also the issue, the issue of race. Uh, race has been a, a, a pretty important debate on on related to police violence in, in the developed world. Um, and I wanted to to see with you if either race or the social identities, uh, um, such as ethnic groups or or, or specific religions, if, 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 if they feel that they are more targeted than, than others and if police violence is particularly acute towards, towards those, those groups. So two questions there and um, we, we also have some other questions uh, coming up and I, I, I will get to them, to them soon. Perhaps uh, Zohe, if, if you could start. You have to unmute yourself. That's fine. Um, yeah, very good questions, both of them. Um, the first one on police corruption, I mean, the way I see it, of course, there's, there's layers to it, right? Um, and I, I sort of touched upon this when I, a little bit when I talked about how much flexibility is kind of afforded to the police because, you know, I, I mean, there's, there's, if, there's, if there's rampant corruption that is sort of enabled because of political patronage, for example, then that has a direct correlation to police violence in Karachi, in my opinion. Um, so officers who, for example, uh, partake in certain authoritarian type of policing, as we, as we have seen in Karachi, they, def they do have links to certain uh, political institutions or political parties, um, which sort of then, you know, and, and that kind of, pra and practicing in that kind of corruption is, is, a, is, is, is is a higher level, uh, you know. But then on on a lower on a lower scale, um, corruption that, for example, you know, in the form of taking bribes, uh, some of that is also just to get things moving within a police station, for example, right? Just to buy basic necessities because it is ultimately a very under resourced and a very poorly managed institution. So that's why I feel like there are varying levels. So yes. A lot of it has has links. A lot of corruption and a lot of like you know, if, if the more money you're taking, the more more you, you know, it's 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 possible that you will be partaking in some sort of violent and extrajudicial activities. But on a smaller scale, you're probably doing that just for the sustenance of stations and getting things done. So I think there is a variation that maybe needs to be recognized a little bit within the institution as well. On the second question. Um, if, you know how they what, do, do certain ethnic groups feel a bit more targeted um yes so the way that i mean you you antonio you've studied uh, you know karachi as well you've you've seen that there are these, these sort of few predominant ethnic groups in the city um and it is very much connected to the to political parties or or groups that want more political power in the city um so I think in that sense, I mean, so for example, in the last few years, we've seen um, that by and large, the ethnic groups that have been targeted in police killings during the operation, for example, since 2013, belong to either uh, Pashto, uh, you know, ethnic groups uh, or, or belong to the Baloch communities. 
Um, and I think that has been fairly problematic. And in the past, we've seen uh, how the police has been used against the Mahajirs, which are the, the Urdu speaking minority. So there is, a, there is that, is that, that element as well. And it's very much tied into sort of the ethnic politics of the city and about each ethnic group wanting more political power and representation. And those who are in power sort of using the police against, against other social groups. So there is, it's very, the, 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 the question of social identity is very, is very prominent and real, I think. Tessa? Yeah, well, thanks for these uh, both really important questions. I mean, corruption, where do we start? Uh, and of course, well, there's, there's a direct positive correlation between corruption and police violence is, of course, very difficult to answer. But I do think, for example, one of the things that you can see in Kenya is that a lot of the, the chains of corruption within the police happen in kind of command structures, right? So bribes that come in or, or other forms of um, a, 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 a certain part of that is paid to one's um, senior and that goes up and goes up. So these very kind of complex webs in which this corruption occurs, and this happens from the moment that a police officer enters the police force, right? They, they enter this kind of system. And I do think that these, these chains of corruption coincide with, with larger problems of command. And I do think that in order to, to transform the police, a lot of effort does need to come from the top. So I, I, I do think that the work of individual police officers is important, but in such a hierarchical organization as the police where command and control structures are, are extremely important, um, we need to address kind of, you know, issues of police leadership. And this is also where I think corruption. So I think uh, one doesn't necessarily make sure that the other happens, but they're both kind of embroidered in the same uh, power structures that kind of uh, allow certain practices to occur. Um, and in terms of uh, disadvantaged communities, I mean, unquestionably so. Um, so Nairobi, this is of course very much a class issue. Um, so people residing in particular neighborhoods who are framed as thugs, uh, while those residing in other neighborhoods are not. So this is, um, and of course, ethnicity is a very politicized issue in Kenya, particularly you see this around the time of elections when police violence also increases, where people of a certain ethnic group are targeted more than others. Um, and of course, in relation to kind of the terrorist threat, um, we see a lot of Somalis or those of Somali descent or Muslims broadly who are more easily suspected of being a, a terrorist than others and are therefore targeted in certain ways. So yes, we can definitely say that there is a, a, a kind of a social, uh, that there's certain groups are more disadvantaged than others when it comes to their relationship with the police. Thanks. Inasio, I'm going to take the liberty of adding two questions here to you uh, and feel free to, to, to answer them in, 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 the, in the order and the length that you, you prefer, but uh, that refers specifically to Rio. So uh, Raul Zepeda Hill um, asks uh, you to, to, to comment on the uh, pacification strategy um, and he specifically refers to something that Benjamin Lassing has written, but I, I'm not familiar with uh, what, what specific piece he is referring to. So if you could uh, share your views on the sort of rise and fall of the pacification strategy, which was used in Rio for some time with some success uh, during some time in the slums of Rio. And also related to Rio, um, someone has asked about, uh, has Rio rec considered a sort of recreation of the police in the manner of the police service in Northern Ireland? Um, I'm, again, I'm not particularly familiar with the Northern I Ireland case, but I'd like to pick your brain on the issue of police reform, which I know has been flouted sometimes in, in Rio, but um, as far as I understand, hasn't really advanced very much. So what, what's in the way of police reform in Rio? Okay, so four questions. I'll try to be brief um, in trying to tackle them. Um, the first two have, a, I think, a clear answer for Rio de Janeiro. First, the relationship between corruption and violence is undeniable in the police. So that uh, it's very interesting on the rhetorical level and on the doctrinal level, you will see politicians saying violence, police violence is a way to cleanse, to cleanse the city. It's a way of doing social cleansing and killing the criminals. Uh, but when you, you see it in, at, the, at the street level, the, what you find is that in many cases, police violence, police operations are really the result of an attempt to increase the bribery uh, the police, the bribes that the police request from the drug dealers. So when they don't pay them enough, then they carry out an operation, they kill one or two, so that the next 
uh, dealers who are going to be in command know that they have to pay the request an amount or else they will be killed too. So the very intimate connection in Rio between police violence, police corruption, even though this is not much talked about and at the rhetorical level, as I was saying, it's seen as a, as a way to do social cleansing and um, it's seen in political terms, but in reality, most of it is economic and is driven by uh, police corruption. The second question can also be answered, I think, very clearly. Um, race is an important issue. We carried out research on Rio police and found that if you are white, you have 8% higher chance of surviving a shootout against the police or an alleged shootout against the police than if you're black. And this difference holds both within the slums, the favelas, and outside the slums, which to us means that there is a clear race differential. However, the biggest uh, cleavage, the biggest differential is not a racial differential, it's a class differential again, or a habitat differential between the slums and the, and the rest of the city. That's what makes the huge difference about how police operate. But within each of these two environments, police tend to be more lethal against black people than against um, uh, white people. Uh, however, unlike in the US, where you typically see white policemen killing black citizens, most of the police force in Brazil and in Rio in particular are, are black. So it's not white killing black, um, it's actually police of any color um, being um, more violent or more lethal against black people. Um, about UPP is the pacification process that would take another whole webinar, uh, but I would just say that um, it was a huge opportunity to change the paradigm of, of public security in Rio and to change the police, and that didn't happen. So it just stayed in the first phase of occupation and they diminished the shootouts and the violence in the beginning. But because the paradigm was never changed, because the relationship between the community and the police never became more community oriented or horizontal, in the end, it just returned to the, to the same old model. And about the Northern Ireland uh, example, I think it's a very good question because Northern Ireland is like the best example of the external oversight mechanisms that Tessa was talking before. Um, but these huge reforms and um, completely external oversight mechanisms in general only happen when there is a change of uh, regime, political regime, or in the case of Northern Ireland, the negotiations between uh, Protestants and, and Catholics. So in, in Rio today or in Brazil today, there are no conditions for such an overhaul in police re reform. And I would ultimately argue that, as I said before, as long as we have um, politicians like Bolsonaro and like Witzel thinking that we can change police behavior by technical solutions which address only the police is an illusion. We have to change the, the leadership, the political leadership, and then we will try to change police uh, mechanisms and operations. But as long as we have these uh, governors and presidents who say police have to shoot to kill, shoot to the head, and they have to kill more, it's useless to think of police reform as I see it. Thanks, Anastasio. Very, very good job at summarizing these very complex issues. So we, we now have uh, a few other questions. Um, I'll start with a general one for, for all the panel, and then we can have our final uh, remarks. Um, what is the role of transnational surveillance technology, uh, such, for uh, such as Chinese facial technology, uh, mobile tracking? Do this tracing technology, surveillance techno technologies are coming into play in these cities uh, to enhance police urban control. Um, then we have a question for, um, for uh, Tessa. Uh, how, how has the impact of US security engagement been, uh, specifically training and equipment support to the police in Kenya? Has it impacted the ability, positively or negatively, the ability of Kenya to institute police reforms? And then one final question to Zoha, which is, um, do you think that this over-militarization of police um, can slow down the progress or derail the implementation of policies such as the National Action Plan to root out problems of terrorism, sectarian violence, organized crime uh, formulated in 2015. So these are some of the final questions, I believe. So perhaps if you can start with, um, again, in the same order, perhaps, Zoha. Your audio, Zoha. <laughs> Your audio. Sorry, can you yes. hear me now? 
Yes. Okay. Um, so the first one was, I think, on the on the role of this sort of smart surveillance technology and facial recognition, and 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 that kind of uh, uh, technology. I think so there, there's a very. I mean, it obviously. So in, if if we look at Pakistan as a whole, there are there's a difference in where and how this technology is being used. Uh, this is not. I'm not an expert on this, but if I can, if I'm just making a general comment, I feel like so there's more of it that you sort of see and and hear about in the province of Punjab. In Karachi, I know that they have periodically tried to bring in, um, you know, uh, more surveillance and smart policing and CCTV cameras and all of that. And they don't always, they're not very sustainable, um, predominantly because I think transporting, you know, existing ideas and structures, uh, you know, technological structures onto, you know, into a city or an, an urban environment that can't support it. It's, they're not gonna. They don't last very long. So at at the moment, I'm I'm quite skeptical about how well they're working. Um, I know I know there are concerns because the way that you know the way that they do get developed, it's a it's with a with a lack of legal frameworks. So there are multiple privacy issues and and you know infringements on civil liberties that can happen as a result because they don't have that kind of framework to rely upon. But on the other hand, there are, there are also not, you don't have that kind of infrastructure in the city of Karachi to be able to sustain them. So I'm not exactly sure how well they're working and to what extent they're actually there. Um, the second question was on, on NAP. Uh, I think that, I think to an extent, the over-militarization, if you want to call it that, of the police happened. I mean, it's been, it's been an, an ongoing process, but it was sort of furthered after NAP came about. Um, so the operation was launched in 2013, and NAP came about after a terrorist attack in December 2014. Um, and to ensure the implementation of the National Action Plan, which was the, the counterterrorism policy of Pakistan, you had these APEX committees, which were these oversight bodies created to ensure that they were implemented, that, that the policy was imp being implemented properly across Pakistan. So you had a body that oversaw how it was being implemented in the city of Karachi. And I think it very much paved the way or enabled the police to kind of act in certain ways uh, and and just go go against you know and 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 sort of eradicate any any kind of threat in, in the city so i think it was very much furthered by the national action plan that said i'm not also very sure how how a functional national action plan is right now it was a very problematic policy um, you don't hear about it that much i know that the current government had received uh, various drafts of newer better policies that have yet to be implemented so I think NAP was very haphazardly created, um, and I don't think that the, that policing or police practices will jeopardize it in, in any way. It's more about the lack of will to improve upon it in Pakistan. So, if that makes sense. Yes, sir. Yeah. Hi. Thanks. Well, uh, I guess I could address the the question about the U.S. engagement in terms of uh, police reform. So. I mean, the U.S. has been one of the prime donors for the Kenyan state uh, police, but also the Kenyan military and kind of the, you know, the global fight against terrorism, et cetera. Um, and I mean, it's always a difficult question whether something has happened positively or negatively and who you're asking. So I think that a lot of the, uh, I know that, for example, IPOA and IU, so the two oversight bodies that I just mentioned, have been funded quite uh, generously by the U.S. Uh, embassy, also in terms of you know, setting up their offices and resources and, and you know, the kind of the infrastructure for these oversight bodies to take place. So, I mean, unquestionably, this financial assistance has helped these organizations been able to do the work that they're doing. Um, on the other hand, um, I think also in terms of, uh, you, there's also, I think, funding doesn't only come in terms of, uh, I mean, this is a larger theoretical discussion in terms of uh, money, but also in terms of certain ideas and practices that come with this money. And I think definitely the militarization has kind of come alongside the US support uh, for Kenya has, has come with a certain idea about what policing is and a certain idea about who should be policed and how they should be policed. Um, and I think that most um, kind of critiques of police reform would say that this has not been um, a very productive in terms of transforming the police in Kenya. So I guess it depends on how how you approach this question. Um, and I guess this, this links to what uh, Ignacio was saying earlier about, and in Kenya, this is often referred to as kind of the software versus the hardware debate, right? So if you ask a police officer what reform is, they're, they're talking about better housing, better salaries, better equipment. And, and to tie this up to the to question about surveillance, um, from my research, I didn't encounter a lot of surveillance 
um, on the daily use by Kenyan police officers. So I, I can't really delve into this matter. But I think if you would ask uh, Kenyan police officers, I mean, I think they would love to wear around, wear a body camera or other forms of gadgets um, or tools to increase it because in their terms, reform is about hardware, about things. Well, uh, kind of in line with what Ignacio would say, I would argue that police reform is much more about changing mindsets, attitudes, ideas about what policing is, about protection, um, et cetera. So yeah, those are my cool. kind of answers to that. Thanks, Tessa. Ignacio, uh, some last thoughts, and uh, perhaps if you if you if you have any thoughts on the issue of um, surveillance and technology, has this been an issue at all in in Brazil or in Rio? Um, it's not a huge issue in Brazil. Um, there are some discussions about technology, um, and technology is, a, is an important tool. There's no question about that. But the idea that technology itself is going to redeem us is a bit naive. For example, we have cameras in certain areas. But when certain very famous cases of police abuse happened, these cameras, of course, were turned off. So that, that's an important thing, because if they turn them off, you know that So it's not irrelevant. But the hope that just cameras by themselves will solve the issues is, I think, a bit naive. So technology has a lot of potential, but also some risks in terms of privacy, as Zoe was saying, but not, all, not also in terms of privacy, but they can also be used for police corruption, for example. Uh, and they can be used, technology can be used to uh, prevent police abuse as well. But um, as Tessa was saying, I think it's more a question of, um, I don't know if she referred to it to as software or hardware, I'm not sure which is which, but it is a question of changing structures, mentalities and values rather than changing um, objects and, and technology. Yeah. So uh, thank you very much to, to all three of our excellent speakers. Uh, if we could physically uh, applaud you, we would. Uh, we applaud you mentally. Um, and thank you also to you for, for watching this. As, as I mentioned, this is part of our urban security briefing. So the idea is that each month we will explore a theme or a policy challenge related to urban areas and urbanization. Um, and uh, so, so, so thank you very much and keep an eye out for, for the next installments. And um, thank you for, for watching. And this will be posted online as well. You can later um, re-watch us if you, if, you, if you so wish. Um, so thank you very much and see you next time.